Hello and welcome to chapter 3. Uh, chapter 3 is going to discuss exponential and log functions. And today in 3.1 we're going to look at exponential functions and their graphs. So to start out with, we're going to look at the definition of an exponential function. And an f exponential function, which is denoted as f of x with a base a, is shown by this right here. So we have a base of a raised to some exponent or x. Now in this case, a is going to be greater than 0 or a positive number, but it's not going to be a number equal to 1 because 1 raised to any power is 1, and that's just a constant. Uh, and now, in this case here, x is going to be any real number. So let's go ahead and look at example 1. We're going to evaluate our functions at the given x value. And if you remember your exponential function on your calculator is going to be the little caret symbol, and it looks like that. And it's actually right above the division side on the right-hand side of your calculator for those of you that have TI-83s or 84s. So let's look at part A. It says to evaluate f of x, which equals 8 to the x, when x equals pi. So this is just going to give me 8 to the power of pi. And when I plug that in my calculator, I get something around 600. And 87.29. When I do the same thing for part B, I end up with 8 to the negative 1 half, and this is going to give me 0 0.3536. Now remember, when you have a negative exponent, that's really moving it to the denominator since this 8 is in the numerator. So I could really rewrite that as 1 divided by 8 to the x or in this case 1 divided by 8 to the 1 half. Then for part C we have 0.8 raised to the negative 2.5 and this is going to give me 1.747. And again, I just I did all of these values in my calculator. Now when we're looking at graphs of functions in the form of y equals a to the x, you're going to end up with something that, let's just sketch this off to the side, that looks kind of like this. This is an exponential curve. Okay, now our domain with exponential curves is going to be all real numbers. We have no limitation as to what we can plug in for x. Our range is going to be all numbers, and if you notice, it looks like this is approaching zero. So it's going to be all real numbers greater than or equal to 0. So we can show that with a 0 to infinity. And in this case, you really have a y-intercept at 1. So we have the coordinate point 0, 1. The end behavior. For the end behavior, you should notice that as our x values so as x approaches a positive infinity, our f of x approaches a positive infinity. And as x approaches a negative infinity, f of x approaches 0. And because f of x is approaching 0, that tells me I have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And for continuity, this is a continuous function. So it is continuous. On the other hand, when I have something in the form of y equals a to the negative x, if I sketch a graph over here, we're going to end up with something that looks like this. So similar, but it is reflected. This is going through the point 0, 1. My domain is still going to be all real numbers. My range is still going to be values of y that are greater than 0. So I'm going from 0 to a positive infinity. My y-intercept is still at 0, 1. And this time, my end behavior, as x approaches a positive infinity, f of x is going to be approaching 0. Likewise, as x approaches a negative infinity, f of x is also going to be approaching a positive infinity. 
So my asymptotes still conclude because I have x approaching infinity as f of x is approaching a number, or 0 in this case. I know that I have an asymptote at y equals 0, and this would be a horizontal asymptote. And this is still a continuous function. Okay, and just to remind you again that when we have negative exponents, we can rewrite them with positive exponents. So you really could have rewritten this as 1 divided by a to the x. It's the same function. Now, because our function, whether it be a to the x or a to the negative x, these functions are both always increasing or always decreasing. So because of this, our function is going to pass the horizontal line test, which tells us that our function is 1 to 1. So for every input, you will have exactly one output. And we can use this 1 to 1 property to help us solve um, different types of problems. And we're going to look at the, I just kind of wanted to touch base on this right here. Two exponents are the same if you have a to the x is equal to a to the y, and they're only the same if your exponents themselves are the same and you have the same base. So with that, let's look at example two. It says a, or for part a, we have 16 equals 2 to the x plus 2. Well, I can't solve for x because I don't have the same base, and therefore I can't set my exponents equal to one another. But I can rewrite 16 as a power with base 2 and an exponent of 4. And now I have 2 to the x plus 2 on this side. Well, because my bases are the same, now all I have to do is equate my exponents. So I really have 4 is equal to x plus 2, which tells me that x is equal to a positive 2. Likewise, for part b, I have 1 divided by 3. I'm going to raise that whole thing to the x power, and this is going to give me 81. So I'm going to rewrite this, because I have one-third, I'm going to rewrite this as 3 to the negative x equals 81. And because I can rewrite 81 as 3 to the fourth, this tells me then that I can equate my exponents because I have the same base. So I have negative x equals 4, or x equals a negative 4. So I can use that one-to-one -one property to help me establish these um, rules and guidelines. Okay, and just like uh, with linear or quadratic or cubic functions, we can also do transformations to graphs of exponential functions. Now, in this case, if our change occurs within the exponent, this is going to give us a shift to the left or to the right. And if it's a plus c, then we're going to be shifting to the left. If it's a minus c, then we're going to shift to the right. It's kind of the opposite of what we think it should be. This right here is actually going to shift our graph up or down based on whether or not it's positive or negative. So this shifts up or down. The sign on A right in here actually is going to indicate whether it's a function that's being reflected over the x-axis. So if my standard function looks like the blue line here like that, and I have a negative a value, it's actually going to make it flip over the x-axis and go down like this. So this is going to give us a reflection over the x-axis if we have a negative a. Now if I have a negative up here, then this is going to give me a reflection over the y-axis. So we'll say reflect over y if a negative x. And that is going to give me something like this, which I just drew in the green there. So for example three, we want to describe the transformations of the graph. Now in part A, I want you to graph y, or I'm sorry, f of x equals 4 to the x, okay? And then on that same graph, I want you to graph b. And I want you to look at the difference between part A and part B. And what you should notice 
is that because I have this x minus 2 right here, my graph will actually shift two units to the right. So it's going to shift two units to the right because of this minus 2 right there, because that's part of the exponent itself. Now with exponential functions, we also have what we call the natural base e. e is an actual constant, okay, and it's the number, it's approximately equal to 2.718281. It is a number that continues on, um, kind of like pi. Uh, the notation is going to look like f of x equals e to the x. You do have a, a natural base button on your calculator. It is actually, um, you have to hit the second button and then the ln button, which is right next to the number 4 on the TI-83s and 84s. That will get you the e to the x button. So when we look at example 4, we're going to evaluate using that e to the x button. So if I evaluate e to the 6.2, then we'll end up with 492.749. Likewise, if I go e to the negative, and please make sure that you use parentheses when you are using exponents here, because sometimes that does make a difference a negative 7.1, this is going to give me 0. Point, I have three zeros and an 8. One of the most common applications of exponential functions deals with compounded interest. Now we have two types of interest that we're going to look at in our story problems. One is when the interest is being compounded continuously, and it will actually say continuously compounded or compounded continuously. This is going to give us the, what we call PERT equation. It's the A equals P or the principal times E raised to the power of RT. And if we're looking at N compoundings per year, like something like we're going to look at the interest monthly or biweekly or daily or quarterly, we're going to use this formula right here. Now, in both cases, T represents years, A is the balance that we have in the account at a given time, P is the principal or starting amount, and R is going to be our rate in the decimal form. Now in this one here, in this compoundings per year formula, you also have N. So N is going to be like if you do something quarterly, that means four times per year, so your N value is actually going to be four. So let's go ahead and look at an example of this. It says one, or on the day, sorry, that should read on. So on the day of a child's birth, a deposit of $25,000 was made in a trust fund that pays eight and a quarter percent interest. We want to find the balance in the account on the child's 26th birthday if the interest is compounded in one of the three ways. Well, I want to look at it being compounded quarterly. So because I'm using a quarterly compound, I need to use the number of compoundings per year formula, which is A equals, and I'm going to write this up at the top, A equals P times the quantity of 1 plus R divided by N raised to the NT power. So in order to find A, I have to multi or I'm going to take my principal, which was $25,000, and multiply that by 1 plus R, which is 8 and a quarter percent. And remember, when we convert percentages to decimals, we move the decimal place two places to the left. So I have 0 0.0825 divided by 4, because quarterly means 4. And I'm going to raise that to the power of 4 times t, which in this case is going to be 26 years for their 26th birthday. Now when I simplify that, this is going to give us $208,941.65. So that's a pretty good chunk of change in 26 years. Now likewise, if I want to look at a monthly calculation, 
that means I'm going to compound it 12 times per year. I still have my same initial amount, or, or $25,000, and I still have the same rate of 8.25% written as a decimal, but this time I'm going to compound it 12 times. So I'm going to replace my N with a 12, and then I have 12 times 26 as the exponent. And when I do this, we end up with 211 thousand nine hundred and eighty nine dollars and thirty four cents and I do need to include the dollar sign for my unit and then last but not least we want to know how much we'll have after 26 years if we're compounding continuously well with continuous compounds we're going to use the PERT formula so I still have my twenty five thousand dollars or my initial amount I'm going to use my natural law or natural base E and my rate of 0 0.0825 and my T of 26 years. When I plug this into my calculator, we end up with $213,551.03. So if you have questions on this, please let me know and I can help you, especially with your calculators. And this is going to take us up to our fun fact or our math humor for the day. With that, have a good night, and I will see you guys tomorrow.